Hi, everybody. Um, people up the back, can you hear me? Oh, you can. Very good. Now, I didn't actually realize that there was going to be hat escalation at this conference. <laughs> So I would just like to point out that I have the original top hat, uh, which, whilst it may not be quite as light and trendy as the others, uh, has stuck around for quite a while. So who out there has a brain? Hands up. OK, fantastic. I hate to break it to you, and you can probably guess from like the, the title of this talk if my slides, yep, fantastic, are up on the screen. Um, if you have a brain, it sucks. And I'm going to tell you why. So the year is 1978, so quite some time ago. And uh, we had psychologists back then. They were doing cool things. In this case, they were doing a perception experiment. They wanted to see how information was processed by the brain. Now, on the surface, this looks like a very, very simple experiment. You have a person. They have a visual divider, so they have two visual fields. On one half, they can see a snow scene. On the other half, there's a chicken lake and they're asked to pick cards which correspond to those two things they can see. What makes this interesting, however, is the patient in this case has a split brain. Their corpus callosum, that's the, um, the part of the brain which joins the two hemispheres, has been completely severed as a radical treatment for epilepsy. So how did they perform? Well, the right eye can see the chicken leg, and sure enough, they pick a chicken to go with it. The left eye sees the snow scene, and sure enough, picks a snow shovel. So far, everything seems normal until you ask the patient why. And they go, well, that's simple. The chicken leg goes with the chicken, and the shovel is used to shovel out the chicken coop. <laughs> Not really what we were expecting. What the hell is going on there? Well, what is going on there is the left hemisphere of the brain, which is what's processing the right visual field, is the only one with speaking capabilities. It's what does spoken language and hearing, understanding of spoken language. So it says, OK, I know why I picked the chicken. I've picked a shovel here. Uh, there must be a good reason. I'll make it up. <laughs> and you can actually watch it making it up. There is part of the prefrontal cortex, the very sort of front bit of your brain, which lights up when we make up facts about ourselves. <laughs> like, you know, I'm a good presenter, or I've had plenty of sleep. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then what you see is uh, the memory sense of the brain light up as it gets put into memory, and then they light up a second time as it gets retrieved. And you go, oh, that must be a true memory, because I remember doing that. No, it's complete rubbish, but it feels like a real memory. So this is a situation where the patient is not just unaware of what's happened, but they are profoundly unaware. They are unaware that they are unaware. They think that, that they know what's going on. But this is not special to people who have had brain surgery. This is actually something that we can all experience, because we all experience consciousness but we can't be aware of everything which is going on. There will be things which are happening <laughs> that we just will not see. So I encountered this particular experiment, and I thought, this is absolutely fascinating. And, and I have a brain, and um, I've got my code. I've, I've got open source code that I can debug. Um, I'd like to have like an open source brain that I can debug. And the first sort of steps to that is learning about your brain. So I thought I would learn from the three sort of master groups of our time about brains. One of those is psychologists who have done a lot of research. Um, another field, a sort of, sort of harder science field, uh, is that of neuroscientists. But the people I found who knew the most about brains, how they work and how to exploit them, were salespeople. <laughs> they are friggin' awesome at getting you to do stuff. They know how our brains work better than anyone else on a sort of functional level. And more importantly, they know how to trick your brain into doing things they want to do. And I want those superpowers. In fact, tricking your brain is incredibly simple because you don't actually have to do that much. Brains have evolved with all these sort of weird things which don't really do what you want, and they'll trick themselves if you let them. So I'll give you an example. There was a study done in 1996 by Barg, Chen, and Burroughs. 
and it involved priming. So what do I mean by priming? Essentially, these tasks were, we're going to set up uh, a bunch of subjects with what looks like a real psychological experiment. Something like rating pictures or doing maths problems or picking cards when looking at pictures, something like that. And beforehand, we'll say, oh, we're just going to give you a language task to measure your language ability, because that will help correlate you with like, you know, other people in your group. Now, that's a big, fat lie that the psychologists are telling you. What they're doing is they're giving you things like anagrams or jumbled word sentences, and they're doing that to influence you. And I'll show you how. So this is an example of a jumbled word sentence. There are five words there, and you ask the person to form a Englishly, an Englishly consistent, an consistent English sentence of four. So he finds it instantly would be a good example. Now, that's not actually priming you for anything. It's, it's not really like any sort of special words in there. The way in which you prime someone is you add words which get them to think about a certain concept or feel a particular way. So here's an example of me priming you. <laughs> you have to form a consistent sentence from that. And there's all sorts of different ways that you can prime people. So you can add rude words. So rude words would be things like brazen or intrude or bluntly. Now, the actual test that they performed was to say, OK, we're going to give people these, uh, these word tests, and then the person is going to have to go to the presenter, go to the person running the experiment, and ask them for the next stage of the test. And that person is effectively stuck in a very long and boring conversation with a colleague. What they were measuring is whether or not the people would interrupt that conversation. And sure enough, the people with the rude priming were much more likely to do so than the people with polite priming. So you can make people more polite or more rude by giving them word tests. You can give them hostile priming. You can give them sort of angry words, and then they'll judge other people more negatively. But what I find most fascinating is you could give them elderly priming. You could give them words like old or gray <laughs> or and I kid you not, this was in the study, Florida. <laughs> and what they measured subsequently was how long it took for the subjects to walk to the elevator. There was somebody sitting in the hallway with a stopwatch in their pocket pretending to read like a magazine, and they would time how long it took people to walk to the elevator. Now, what happened is the people with the, uh, the elderly priming took significantly longer to walk to the elevator. <laughs> now, these are not just normal people. These are almost universally done on psychology students. And the reason is because you can say, hey, we'll give you course credit if you come and do this weird psych experiment we thought up. So a lot of these studies are done on psych, uh, psych students. And you'd expect them to know better. So when they are asked, did the word puzzle influence you, I would expect the psych students to say, of course, because that's what priming is all about. But they almost universally say, no, of course not. It's an anagram or it's a word puzzle. It couldn't possibly influence me. And you then reveal to them that they walked more slowly to the elevator. And you ask them why. Now, the correct answer that they would give back is, I don't know. Because they don't, they didn't think that the word test had any influence, but that's not what they say. What they say is, I was tired. <laughs> or they say, oh, my, my foot hurts, or I was thinking about some sort of a problem. What they come up with are a whole set of excuses which are practically identical to what an external observer would come up with. It's the same bit of the brain making stuff up. But it also demonstrates something which is more important. And that is automatic behavior. Effectively, when we give people words, when we let people think about things, the brain assumes that that thinking is for doing. So if we're thinking about being slow, or thinking about being rude, or thinking about being productive, we will then do those things. One place where you can abuse this is with prices. <laughs> so, Here's a beautiful keyboard and a beautiful mouse. They're wireless. I have no idea how much these are worth. And psychology students also have no idea how much these are worth. 
So you have a room of psychology students who are starving psychology students. You know, they've, they've got a bit of money which they can use to you know, buy food here and there. Um, but the actual experiment has them bidding on these items with real money, their own money. And what they're asked to do is write down on a piece of paper how much they would pay for a whole sequence of items. There's a few other things besides from like the, the keyboard and the mouse, their maximum bids. And then based upon who has the maximum bid, they get to win the item and actually pay cash for it. But first, before they write down their bids, they are asked to write down the last two digits of their social security number <laughs> next to where their bid will go. Now, this doesn't change their bid. It's not like you know, something which is going to be used at all in the bidding process. But do you think that might influence them? Well, in a rational world, it should have no influence whatsoever because they're just two arbitrary numbers. But if you look at the results that this causes, they're quite amazing. People who have the larger social security numbers, the last two digits, are bidding significantly more, in some cases almost three times as much, <laughs> for these items, which is absolutely astounding. And this is an effect known as anchoring. Effectively, as soon as we have an idea of a price in our mind, or of something at all in our mind, that's what we're going to use to compare everything else against. And the reason that we have this behavior is because we suck at determining values. Looking at the keyboard and the mouse, we, we don't really know how much they're worth, so we're just kind of taking guesses and, hey, there's a number, we'll adjust from there. What we are good at is comparison. So if you look at the graph again, everybody was paying more money for the keyboard and mouse combo than the, for the mouse alone. People understood that having an extra item in there made it more valuable. Now, you'd think this would be good, that we're actually you know, good at, uh, at doing comparisons, but, but you can exploit this as well. So, um, bread makers. Who has a bread maker? Some people. OK. Bread makers, oops. Bread makers, when they first came out, there's a bread maker. Bread makers, when they first came out, big clunky thing, there was one company that made them. And they released this bread maker onto the market at the price of $275. And people would look at the bread maker and they go, I've never seen a bread maker before. I have no idea what the value of a bread maker is to me, and they wouldn't sell. Nobody would buy these things because nobody knew if that was a good deal or a bad deal. So what the company did is they employed some very clever people, and they recommended that the company should build another bread maker <laughs> that was bulkier and less attractive. And then they should put that on the shelves in the same stores as their original bread maker, but charge 50% more for it. <laughs> now what happens is, of course, people can do a comparison. They say, well, I don't know anything about bread makers, but out of these two, I'd much rather have the one that's sort of slimmer and, and cheaper. And suddenly, they started flying off the shelves. <laughs> Nobody purchased the big bread makers, but it was important that they were there. And this demonstrates an idea of relativity, that we like to make comparisons relative to something else. In fact, whenever we do anything, we then use that as a benchmark, and we use things which are relative to that. And uh, in fact, the bread maker there is a great example of a decoy choice. A decoy choice is something you put there to influence people, but you know people will never, ever, ever pick. So there was a, a magazine, it was actually an economics magazine, that offered these two options. You could get an internet-only version of it for $59, or you could get internet and print for $125. And they got together like a study group, and they said, OK, you know, assuming you want to buy this magazine, which one would you go with? And what they found is the majority of people wanted the internet version, which is much, much cheaper. Then they changed things a little bit, and they introduced a new option. So you could get internet-only for $59, print-only for $125, or internet and print for $125. Now, you look at that, <laughs> and you're thinking, are these guys mad? <laughs> do, do they realize that no one's going to pick that middle option? And they do realize that no one's going to pick the middle option. The reason that's there is a dummy choice. It means that people are saying, OK, I don't know very much about how much the print magazine is worth, but it looks like it's worth 125 so, oh, I can get that with internet as well. It's a steal. And suddenly, everything changes. 
now you have not only the majority of people, but the vast majority of people going for internet and print. So that one decoy choice, which nobody ever picks, influences people into thinking that's a good deal. So can you use this for other things? Hell yes, you can. <laughs> this has got to be one of my favorite things in the world, because you can use it with people. How does it work with people? Well, if you want to be selected for something, let's say you want to be selected for a job, or you want to be selected for a sports team, or even want to be like selected on a date, what you want to do is find someone who is similar to you, but not quite as cool. <laughs> and people say, well, I don't know about the other candidates, but, but out of these two, this guy's so much nicer. Now, one of the things I find most fascinating about learning about brains is, is memory. And every time I read like a memory study, my jaw drops. I'm absolutely amazed by them. Um, one, because the studies are awesome. And secondly, because almost without fail, I wonder how on earth did they get them past the ethics committees? <laughs> because some of the things that people do with memory are just, they're a little bit wrong. Um, people who study memory seem to be differently moral <laughs> to the rest of us. And, and I'll give you an example of this. So there was, there was one study um, where they, they asked people that it is conformed cons informed consent, so people were told what was going to happen. Um, but they were shown um, horrifically scary images and video. And then half of them were asked to play Tetris for an hour. And, and what they were measuring is to see whether or not playing Tetris would stop flashbacks to the horrifying video in the week later. Now, this is a, a bizarre experiment to come up with, but the, the weird thing is it works. <laughs> <laughs> Tetris actually interferes with your long-term memory laydown. So that's something which you might want to keep in mind. The, the other thing, um, and I need to explain a, a little bit more about memory here, um, is that there are two types of memory that we often deal with. Um, one type of memory is, is remembering the past, uh, things as they were, and, and we call that remembering. Um, the other thing which we do is we remember things in the future. And um, you know, there's my flying car, which is going to come out, what was it, like 1967, that car was going to be available. Um, but remembering the future is called imagination. And I actually call these both remembering because they pretty much work the same way. So if I give you a task, and I say, OK, you know the song Happy Birthday, at which point is the high note of Happy Birthday, the highest note in that song? And what you're all doing now is you're singing the Happy Birthday <laughs> songs in your head to figure out where that is. If I ask you to think about penguins, and I say, OK, you've got a penguin, is it feet longer then it's fins, it's flippers. And now, of course, what you're doing is you're all thinking about penguins, and you're visualizing those. That's important, because in that imagination, and also in that remembering, like you remember how the Happy Birthday song goes, you are reusing your existing brain architecture. So not only do you have cognitive processes going on, you're reaching out to like your, your uh, visual centers and your auditory centers, and you're employing them. And you can see that quite visually when you sort of look at someone's brain activity. What you discover, however, is that if somebody is sort of visually occupied, they can't do the penguin problem. They're too busy looking at something else. <laughs> and likewise, if somebody is like, you know, occupied audibly, they can't think about the happy birthday song. If you're busy singing another song to them, they can't think about the happy birthday song. Now, what we call this in, in sort of brain terms is reality first. Reality gets priority. And that's a very important survival skill. <laughs> it really, really is. Um, but it means that you can't use those centers if reality is using them for something else. Now, you would think this is kind of obvious that you know, most of the brain centers would work this way. Um, but in science, it's important to test. And so the psychologists are like, well, what if the emotional architecture works the same way? When I, I think about you know, some happy event in my life, do my emotional centers get used there? Or is it purely in a cognitive state? And this is where we get to like, the morally different thing. Because 
you can sort of make people visually occupied by like, you know, giving them a visual task, and you can make them you know, audibly occupied by putting headphones on them. To make them emotionally occupied, what they did is they gave them a set of psychometric tests. The, the, the people in the study is a set of psychometric tests. And then regardless of what those test results were, they said, oh, we're, we're very sorry, but uh, you know, I have a PhD in, in psychology, and I can see from your test here that even if you've got friends now, you're not going to end up with any friends in like two years' time. <laughs> and, and you're going to die like miserable and alone. <laughs> and, and they would invoke this, this horrible state of like psychological shock. And um, then of course you'd have to test to see if the person was actually in that state. And um, the way in which we can tell if people are emotionally shut down is that the, uh, the emotional centers for pain share the same pathways as the physical pathways for, fa for pain. So you can tell if someone's like in emotional pain or emotional shock by poking them with sharp objects. <laughs> <laughs> and, and seeing what their pain threshold is, but that's not very scientific. So instead, there is an instrument called a pressure algometer, which is designed to deliver precise <laughs> and specific amounts of pain. Now, I can only imagine the sort of people who are on the ethics committees here. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, when someone is emotionally shut down, they can't predict their future emotions. <laughs> no real big surprise there. But one of the problems is they don't necessarily realize that. We know when we can't listen to the happy birthday song internally, and we know when we can't visualize a penguin, but we don't always realize when our emotional centers are being used for something else. And this results in all sorts of problems. It means that people who are full can't imagine being hungry, or the reverse, if you've ever been to the supermarket when you're hungry. People who are depressed have a really hard time being happy or imagining that they're happy. People who are Star Wars fans have a really hard time imagining that they might regret that tattoo that they got. <laughs> I know, it just keeps getting better, doesn't it? <laughs> so, one of the things which is staggering here is in fact how unaware of our own emotions we can be. They're one of those things which we don't really handle that very well on sort of a, a cognitive level. So I'm going to introduce something which I know Portland has a lot of, and, and that's bridges. And um, there's a particular bridge, this is up in, in Canada, and um, that bridge, yeah, Canada, because that's where Canadian bacon comes from. Um, <laughs> This particular bridge, that's the actual picture of it, um, is this enormously high bridge. Um, it's really scary to cross because it sways a lot, and there's like this huge drop down. Um, and if you go further along the river a little bit, there's another bridge, which is much, much safer, and there's like a two-foot drop, and it's not scary at all. So what the experiment involved is setting up a, a psychologist, and the same psychologist each time, who would be standing at the end of each bridge, and they'd be saying, excuse me, I'm a psychologist from the University of so-and-so. Um, I'm doing a study in um, you know, how people's bridges, like how bridges affect people's cognition. Could you please answer a small survey? And people, like just random people visiting the park would answer the survey. And after they'd filled out all the questions, what they'd do is they'd tear off a sheet of paper and um, they'd say, look, here is my name and here is my telephone number. So if you have any questions about the study, if you want to receive a copy of the results later on, then give me a call and I'll be happy to help. And of course, what they did is they provided different fake names, different names uh, for the people crossing the scary bridge versus the safe bridge. And then what the study actually analyzed is how many people called afterwards, and what they specifically analyzed is how many of those asked the researcher out on a date. <laughs> Amazingly, scary bridge, significantly more dates. <laughs> Again, what the hell is going on here? It's the same researcher both times. It was like, you know, the same day. How is the scary bridge more dates? Well, to explain this, we need the two-factor theory of emotion. 
the two factor theory of motion goes a little bit like this. Let's pretend you're on something like a roller coaster. Now, roller coasters are scary. And when you're scared, you have an elevated heart rate, your pupils will dilate, you'll perspire lightly. <laughs> These are all physiological conditions that you'll experience. But you also know cognitively that roller coasters are safe in most amusement parks. <laughs> <laughs> And so you sort of know that you're safe and that this fear response is unwarranted, but you're still having it. And so you look for cues as to why you might be feeling this. Now, one of those cues might be that you're attracted to the person next to you. And in fact, you see this in movies all the time, where somebody gets rescued, and then the next thing which happens in the movie is they kiss. Even though they don't necessarily know each other, and even though being rescued is not really a good reason to start a relationship but you see it all the time. So, <laughs> there is in fact an obvious exploit there which I will not mention, <laughs> but instead I want to talk about how we can exploit some of the other things which I've mentioned in this talk. Um, one of which is situational effects. A lot of the things which I've shown you are highly situational. If I put you in the right environment to be thinking something, you will be better at doing that. And I see this in myself all the time. When I'm in my office, I'm much better at working. When I'm in the cafe, I'm much, much better at thinking. When I'm at home, I like to think that I'm better at working on my talks, but really I'm much better at Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> you should also make sure that you are aware of decoys. So if you spot one of those little things that I showed you before, the option that you would never, ever, ever pick, that is probably somebody trying to convince you to pick something else, and you should be aware of that. Finally, if you ever find yourself emotionally compromised, then you should sort of sit back and think about what we learnt, and you should cosplay some Tetris pieces <laughs> until you're feeling better. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Thank you.